Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very pleased to bring my conversation with Douglas Fatuma. Douglas is an evolutionary biologist. He is the distinguished professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook University. He is also a research associate on staff at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He is the recipient of many awards, such as the Guggenheim Fellowship and a Fulbright Fellow, and he is also part of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, his work mostly focuses on speciation and population biology, and he is obviously the author of um, many articles in the literature and numerous books, and also the author of the most recent book, How Birds Evolve, and that's what we talk about in this conversation. Um, Douglas is the first to point out that he is not an ornithologist. Um, he is a biologist, um, but there is something absolutely wonderful about how we understand um, birds through the use of evolution. And so that's kind of his uh, lens that he's focused on, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, the, we start the conversation by talking about how evolutionary biology helps us understand birds. And we, we start right out the gate with, with that uh, premise. We talk about the importance of the phylogenetic tree for birds. We talk about the genetics uh, of many birds. We talk about why variation in birds is so important. And we give examples of color variation and polymorphism. We talk about the three key questions of evolution and how we can use those questions to help us understand many things in the natural world, including birds. We talk about why there are so many birds and talk about speciation. We talk about the developmental life cycles of birds, social lives of birds, and then we, we kind of end on the um, note of how the impact of climate change and the future of birds um, is shifting because of some of the changes. I have to say, you know, Douglas was an absolute wonderful person to talk to um, about birds and about biology at large. Um, his book is fabulous, um, and I learned so much reading it and, and talking with him, and um, it's one of one of the conversations that I, I really value. And so um, now I bring you Douglas Fatuma. I am here with Douglas Fatuma. Douglas, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to talk with you about your, your book and your research. So uh, big thanks for you for, uh, for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Uh, we were just talking about it, but you have written a wonderful book um, called How Birds Evolve, What Science Reveals About Their Origin, Lives, and Diversity. Uh, it has a beautiful cover, beautiful illustrations. And I have to say, some of the content. I mean, there are some chapters in here that are rich with data and information. I was, I was actually kind of blown away um, by how much was really in here. And it's, it's just a really uh, fantastic book. So um, yeah, I'm very excited to talk with you about that. Uh, tell people who you are, what you do, um, what your research is in, all of the, the wonderful good stuff. Right. So, um, so I'm recently retired as of, as of two years ago um, from, uh, from teaching and being a full-time um, faculty member, a distinguished professor is, is my title, um, at, uh, in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook University, which is on Long Island, about um, 60 miles east of New York City, for people who haven't been out this way. And um, uh, and my general field is evolutionary biology. Um, I've, you know, I started teaching that subject in 1970, uh, a year after I got my PhD. Uh, and, um, uh, and incidentally, at that time, there was not a really, uh, there really wasn't a textbook on evolution that was suitable for a college course. And so um, one thing led to another, and I ended up writing one. Wow. And that was that's one of one of my to the extent I have any claims to fame at all. That's one of them because it's it's I'm, I'm actually now revising it for the eighth edition. Oh my goodness! Uh, along wow. along with a co-author uh, at this point. Wow. Um, but anyway, so so my field is is uh, evolutionary biology. Um, 
My research has not been on birds. I lay no claim whatever to being an ornithologist, um, um, uh, but, uh, but my research has been on insects, and in particular, insects that eat plants. And I've been very interested in the fact that, first of all, there are thousands and thousands of, you know, of insects that do. The majority, you know, more than half of insect species eat plants. And what's fascinating about them is that many, many, many of them are very, very specialized. They're very particular about what they will eat. Um, and so if you have tomato hornworm caterpillars, you know, eating your tomatoes, uh, that's pretty much the only plant they'll eat. You know, they won't touch peas or Swiss chard or anything else that's in your garden. Mm -hmm. And so I've been really interested in, in you know, why, why that pattern of evolution has been so common in insects. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's quite aside from the fact that I wrote this, the, this book. And so how did, here I am, I, I study insect evolution. What am I doing writing, writing about birds, you may ask. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is that I became fascinated with natural history and with animals as a kid growing up in the Bronx in New York City. Um, and the Bronx has some wonderful parks, and it also includes the Bronx Zoo, which at that time at least had more species of animals than any other zoo in, in the U.S. Um, and I just started becoming fascinated with the diversity of life. Um, I think at one point I pretty I pretty much knew every species of bird they had in the zoo as well as well as all the mammals and reptiles and and so forth. Um, and pretty soon, by the age of eleven, I was I you know I, my father had given me some very inexpensive binoculars and I was starting to watch birds. And uh, I've been doing that on and off ever since. Um, and so, um, and so basically, so birds have been a very important part of my, both of my training as a biologist in a sense of becoming, you know, personally acquainted with the diversity of life and becoming interested in what explains that diversity. Um, uh, but they've, uh, of course, also been then a, a source of great pleasure and just, you know, a very, very important part of my, my emotional life, so to speak, yeah. um, and aesthetic life. Uh, and, um. And as time went on, I, it, well, and, and, and another, I should say that when I went to college at, at Cornell, um, of course, it had the Laboratory of Ornithology, which has become a very famous institution. And it's really, it is probably, it's pr probably has the, the, it has more bird related research and public outreach of various kinds than any, any other institution that I know of in the world. Um, but also at that time, there was an ornithologist on the faculty from whom I, I took courses, and he was doing research on a variety of things having to do with bird evolution. And so that was that was one of my earliest insights into the fact that, you know, that you could spend your life being a being a biologist, which meant not just teaching, but actually trying to contribute to knowledge and, and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so um, and so so birds played a role in my eventually in my becoming a, a biologist. Mm. Yeah, that's really, really nice uh, kind of uh, narrative arc that you have about how all of these worlds kind of connect and collide. I guess uh, one question on that, I guess, is why uh, this book then? Uh, it seems that the in the book, it's much of an emphasis on birds' evolution, not necessarily other aspects or features of birds. Um, and so why why did you decide to to write this book about uh, about birds? Well, because... <laughs> Well, why there are two questions. Why why write about birds? Why write about evolution? And more specifically, why put them together? Right. Uh -huh. And so I've I'm, so I've told you that 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 you know, that birds to me basically unite my my aesthetic and, and, and an important part of my aesthetic life and my and my avocation. You, they unite that with my professional special specialization, which is evolutionary biology. And so, of course, if I you know if I'm going to write about birds, it's going to be about some aspect of their evolution because that's what I know and understand. <laughs> I could not write a book about the physiology of birds or how they migrate or any of these other things in which I would have to do just as much reading on the subject as you would to be <laughs> before I could begin to say anything at all mm -hmm. uh, about it. And I'm kind of assuming that you're not an expert on the physiology of I bird migration. Definitely not an expert on the physiology okay, of birds. Okay. <laughs> so then, then we have something in common. Um, so so, uh, so anyway, so um, so uh, so as I say, it's it's a way of uniting. It's kind of integrating, my, you know, the, the both the personal and the professional uh, mm -hmm. to, to write a book on this thing.
Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, and, and, and let me just add to that that as I as as I, I begin the book by pointing out that birds have played a really important role in the development of evolutionary biology, in the understanding of how evolution works and what has happened in time. Ever since Darwin, you know, I, began, I, I opened the book, almost opened the book, with talking about you know, some of the birds that Darwin describes in The Voyage of the Beagle, and then in The Origin of Species, and then in The Descent of Man, you know, this great big book that he published in 1871, half of which is not about humans, it's about what he called sexual selection. And he has two large chapters drawing examples of what he thought was, you know, the um, the, uh, the evidence for sexual selection, two large chapters just on birds. Um, and so, so they, and ever since then, birds, because they're so easy to see, they're relatively easy to study. Um, they are very well known. You know, the vast majority of species of birds in the world, you know, are known. They're named. They've been described, which is not the case, for example, for any group of insects, in which there are many, many, many undescribed species. Um, but birds are really well known, and of course, so much is known about them specifically because because they're they're popular, they're beautiful, they're audible, they're easily seen in your backyard or just about anywhere. Um, and so that means that there's a lot of people out there who may not be trained in science at all, but they're looking at birds either very actively as active birders or casually looking at the birds at their backyard feeder. Um, and they're aware at least of some of the, the diversity of life. And every once in a while, they'll see a bird do something and they may wonder why is it doing that or, or what's going on here, or they may wonder, you know, why are male birds generally more brightly colored than females? Um, and so there are lots of questions you can ask about birds. And the more you look at them, the more questions may occur to you. You know, what we, you, you and I were just talking about Ecuador before this you, the interview began. And I pointed out that there are more species of birds in the northern Andean countries of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru than there are anywhere else in the world. And you can ask, why is that the case? You know, why are there, why can I see more birds in three weeks in Ecuador? Mm -hmm. Than more species than I could see in the entire United States. Well, in in one year, I could you know. I mean, that, you know. so um, so there are many many questions that you can ask about birds, and as is the case with so much in biology, the answer to those questions will lie partly in understanding what the history of their evolution has been, and what the processes of evolutionary are of evolution are that lead to certain kinds of characteristics. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. Your 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 answer there is is leading to a kind of one of my first general questions, which is how evolutionary biology helps us understand the evolution of birds. And so, how do we look at, I guess, in one way, birds that no longer exist, and then how do we have birds that do exist now, and how we understand genetics and the fossil record? How do all of these things and the evolution of birds help us just understand evolution uh, in general? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bit, that's a very large question, <laughs> and uh, let's we, how, how can I begin? begin? Um, so Darwin really Darwin. If you read, read the Origin of Species, you will realize that he had two major propositions in the Origin of Species, and these two propositions really are the big core questions that you can ask about evolution. Because his proposition number one was that evolution has happened, and in particular, that all species of birds have come from one common ancestral species that has have gave rise to two or more species, each of which gave rise to two or more species, and so forth. And further, he went so far as to propose that if you take that logic backwards, you'll see that basically there may have been only one original form of life that gave rise to the entire living world. Yeah. So that's a staggering idea. Nice. Um, but it's something that you can study by looking at one particular group of organisms and seeing how different species are related to one another. 
you know, so various species of warblers will, will come from a common ancestor. Various species of sparrows come from one ancestral species of sparrow. If you go far enough back in time, you'll find that you, that you that there was an ancestral species that gave rise to ultimately to a proto warbler, you know, and to a proto sparrow. And you can trace that all the way back through all the birds, that, all the birds that we know of, all the living birds that we know of. And nowadays, DNA sequences are the evidence that you use to determine basically who is related to whom. Um, and um, so, one, so one of the big questions then in evolutionary biology is, what has been the history of life? What has happened? Mm -hmm. You know, where did it all start and how did it unfold and develop and so forth from, from there? And it's pretty hard to do that by studying all living things at once because there are millions and millions of them. And so most of the progress has been made from taking particular groups of organisms, such as birds or Drosophila fruit flies or primates, now that we have DNA evidence, and being able to sort of, you know, to really see how things are related back in time, you know, how far back in time do, you know, did the common ancestors of these things occur, and so on. And some of that then connects to the fossil record, in which the you find additional evidence of what the ancestry and what the relatives of today's organisms have been if you go far enough back in time. You know, you run out of you run out of the ability to use DNA as you go back and you're looking at, at fossilized bones, but you can use anatomy and of course, and of course, traditionally anatomical characteristics, the kinds that you can you, you know, study in fossils, provide that evidence of relationships and how organisms have changed over time. In the case of birds, the fossil record is not as rich as it is for some other kinds of organisms, such as clams and snails, but um, but um, but there are enough that we know quite quite a lot about the, the historical evolution of birds and how, how different forms came into existence and became extinct over time. And of course, as probably much of the, of the audience knows, um, we now know for sure that birds basically are modified dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. You know, that you go back and the dinosaurs were in the Jurassic, were this incredibly prolific group of organisms, you know, mm -hmm. ranging from the giants that we all know about to little things that were no bigger than chickens. Um, and, um, and indeed, you know, we, we, the, the evidence is now incontrovertible that, um, you know, that birds evolved from one of those, one of those flying dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one side, that's one side of the story is you know, Darwin basically is saying everything's evolved from common ancestors, which then leads us to ask, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we manage to find the evidence to tell the, the story of the history of life? Um, and, you know, and you can do that for birds, you can do it for primates, you can do it for clams. Um, and I happen to be into birds, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've done a little bit of that kind of work myself with respect to beetles, but I won't, I won't go into that <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's the other it's, big question that Darwin, you know, with the other big theme of the origin of species, mm -hmm. and Darwin's big, big, great, important idea was the question of okay, so if all this evolution is, has happened, how did it happen? What what has been the cause? Mm -hmm. And his brilliant insight was the idea of natural selection, and the idea that if there are variant forms of a species that have some characteristic which is aberrant, but which in one way or another improves the ability of those individuals to survive or to reproduce, that means that that variant type will make more of itself. And if it makes more of itself than the, than the standard type does, then eventually it will become more and more common and ultimately become the dominant or predominant uh, most you know, common form of the species. Um, and um, and so that is that then leads you into into a large area in which you can say, all right, if if most of the features of birds or of beetles or clams or whatever, um, if most of these features have evolved by natural selection, just if, and we look at different kinds of features, we can ask, well, just why was it advantageous to individuals to have this feature rather than that mm -hmm. one? And so this is where you begin to ask. Why is it advantageous for male birds to be, for cardinals, you know, for the male cardinal to be brilliant red mm -hmm. instead of the drab or reddish brown uh, female, you know, or why is it, um, you know, why is it the case 
that some species of birds um, lay, lay their eggs in the nest of other species rather than building their own nest and taking care of their own offspring? Or why is it the case that in some species of birds, both the male and the female will take care of the offspring and feed them? And in other cases, it will just be one sex or the other. Um, and, you know, and you can ask those kinds of questions for every characteristic. Because when you think about it, well, once upon a time, there weren't any birds, right? And so all the characteristics of birds, since birds have come into existence, all of their characteristics have evolved. They've, they've come into existence. They didn't used to exist when you, if you go way, way back beyond the origin of birds. Um, and, so, and so you can ask the question, well, why, why was it that those features evolved? And this is where we get into several of the chapters of my book, where I ask, um, how do we explain these various aspects of the life history and behavior of, of birds? Yeah, no, it's, just, it's very, very powerful. And I like the way you explain it. It's interesting because we everything is connected, whether it's closely in time or, or further apart in time, everything has a type of, of connection, which I do want to ask about the dinosaur piece because I think it's fascinating, but maybe this will link up together. Um, one of the the... Um, main ornithologist is Richard Prom, uh, who I've talked with, um, and he has his phylogenetic tree and mm. has these kind of major groupings. And so mm. in trying to understand the diversification of birds, of how we understand it now, what is the importance of a, either his phylogenetic tree or just a, a kind of taxonomy to understand all of the different groupings of birds? Where does that become um uh, really important for having the utility of identifying, but then understanding uh, the, the similarities and differences between bird groups. <laughs> okay, well, they, um, they, we, that's a big question, like all of your questions. Um, okay. And I should, I should say that, that I know Rick Crum quite well, um, and uh, we, we like one another. We don't always agree on everything, um, <laughs> uh, as you may have discovered in talking with him. That Not that he would have mentioned me, but the old, he, 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 he has his opinions on some things that are not necessarily shared by everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, his group, uh, you know, he and his group have 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 produced they're one of several groups that have used dna sequences to determine the relationships the family tree the phylogenetic tree of all of the major groups of birds um, and my 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 impression is that that his work is at least as strong as and, and by and large they tend to agree on most of most of the relationships um, and um, and his work involved more dna and i think you know analyzed in ways that were more sophisticated than some of the other studies um, so um so there are so many things that you can learn from 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 from, from a uh, from a phylogeny okay so let me give you um one example um if you were to look at this entire tree, we'll see that down at the base, you know, you have some ancestral bird or whatever, which is the ancestor of all of our living species. And if you look at the living species from which you can get the DNA that's necessary to do this, you'll, you'll find there are two great groups. One group are called the paleognates. That means having an ancient jaw, an old style jaw, a jaw uh, skeleton. And the other are called, and all the other birds are called the neognates, the new jaws. Okay. The paleognates are things like ostriches, um, the, the big flightless birds, and not so big like kiwis. They're in there as well, whatever. And, um, and, and all of them, except for one, one group, all of them are flightless. Um, the one group are called tinamous. They're an um, obscure family of South America. American, tropical American birds that kind of look like partridges or, or, or chickens, but but um, and then you know and then you have all the other all the other all the other birds, okay, and all okay. Now I'll come to those other birds in a moment, but let's just take the paleognates. And um, for the longest time, here here's the phylogeny. For the longest time, the classification, the belief was that the tenemus were one branch and they're able to fly. And all of the flightless ones were another branch. So we have the ostrich and the rias and the and the kiwis and the cassowary in New, in, in, in New Guinea and, and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if that was the case, and if then then we would assume that all of these four these flightless groups come from a flightless ancestor. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the question one then was, well, 
the, you know, the ostriches in Africa and the rias are in South America and the cassowaries and emus are in, um, are in uh, Australia and, and, um, and uh, New Guinea. And the kiwis and the extinct moas, which also belong in this group, uh, again, big, gigantic, flightless birds, they're in New Zealand. How did they get? If they couldn't fly, how did they get there? Mm -hmm. How do they get to all those places? And so for the longest time, people were trying to, to figure out how maybe they got there by continental drift. Mm -hmm. That those southern continents at one time were a great big massive continent, Gondwana, and the ancestor of these birds lived there and proliferated and occupied all the various parts of Gondwana that since split apart. And that's how we got to have all these big flightless birds on, on the various southern land masses. Okay. So a very reasonable hypothesis, except that if you ask the geologists, you know, they'd say, well, um, basically that is unlikely because Gondwana started splitting apart before there were any birds, you know, before, 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 before the common ancestor of these birds. If you, if you, you can use the, the degree of difference in their DNA sequences to get an estimate of how far back in time they all evolved from their common ancestor. And the answer is that that was too recent for that ancestor to have been walking around all over Gondwana. Okay. So somehow God, those pieces of land masses were already pretty well separated by the time these different groups of, of flightless birds um, uh, were, you know, got to them. And, and now we understand better what had happened because now that we have DNA, Remember the tinamous, this, these, these flying, partridge-like flying birds in, in tropical America. It turns out that they're not outside these, these, big, the, the, these others. Rather, one of these branches is the tinamous inside. Mm. Okay? And the tinamous can fly. And so that starts to imply the possibility that the tinamous, if they have retained the basic bird capacity for flight, throughout their entire evolutionary history, then it means that their ancestor going way back to the beginnings of beginnings of, of birds was flying, 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 and they continue to be able to fly right up to the present. But if that's the case, then since the tinamous are inside, it's they're just one branch among these paleognites, if that's the case, it implies that the ostrich and the rias and the cassowaries may have independently evolved their flightlessness. Mm -hmm. They independently, they may have flown, their ancestors flew to these land masses, they were able to fly. But once they got there, they evolved, they became gigantic, they became incapable of flight, and they became the giant the flightless birds that we got today. So we have two totally different hypotheses to explain how we get these large flightless birds on these different land masses. Okay, One of them involving continental drift but that's based on a what we now understand was the wrong the wrong phylogenetic tree. It was based purely on skeletal characteristics. Um, not and now that we have much more information in the DNA, we're pretty sure that this other phylogenetic tree is the right one, and that one enables you to explain how you got these big these big birds on all those southern land masses. They flew there, and then they became flightless. Okay? Um, so at least at this point, that is the, 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 high, the stronger hypothesis. Can I say that it's proven? No, I don't think it, most scientists, if they're really careful about it, won't say that they proved anything. Mm, sure. but, they, but they would say, at this point, this hypothesis fits the data much better than the old hypothesis did. And this is something that comes from having a firm understanding of the relationships among these, among these different groups of birds. Is this some aspect of convergent evolution here for these birds then? In that, in this, definitely. In this case, you would say, so convergent evolution is the idea that, that in different lineages, you independently get the evolution of a very similar characteristic. Okay. Um, and of course, we know this happens all the time. You know, crows are black, so are black racers, you know, and, and black rat snakes and black bears. I mean, you, you can go on, right? Mm -hmm. So black coloration has evolved many, many times, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so, um, and so in this case, you would, you would say it looks as if ostriches, South American rias, um, the kiwis in, and, and, uh, in New Zealand and the um, cassowary and, and emu in Australia have independently evolved, convergently evolved, large size and flightlessness. 
So I guess maybe this would be an interesting way to talk about, you mentioned in the book, three ways of evolution by natural selection, how it works. Individual and population varying in characteristic, variation and inheritance and correlation with characteristics and also the reproductive rate. How would these birds then, what would be, if you want to say utility, I guess that's one way of saying it, but what would be, in terms of their environment, what are the things about them growing larger in size and not being able to fly? How would that be adaptive for them? And if they're in different contexts on the, on the globe, why? So if they, if through convergent evolution, they're saying, hey, we're going to independently not fly and grow up to large size. And I think at least with the ostrich, very fast, they can run very fast, they're bipedal. How, what would be the, adaptive uh, necessity for these birds uh, in different parts of the planet to um, potentially they, do that. Okay, I, I don't think I would use the, I, w- I don't think I would necessarily use the word necessity, at, and, but instead opportunity. Okay. okay. So, um, okay, so it's really the critical point to realize, of course, is that in any particular environment you go into, whether it's a forest or a grassland or, you know, or a marsh or whatever, um, there are different opportunities, okay? Mm. There are different, there are different kinds of food that may be, that you, that may be available, you know, there could be seeds, there could be snails, there could be insects, there could be small, small animals, you know, salamanders to eat or whatever, you know, other, other small animals. Um, there would be different different micro habitats within that habitat. So in a salt marsh, the upper mar- the upper marsh and the lower marsh are different. In a forest, you certainly have some um, patches that are relatively light, where let's say where a tree fell and they, their young tree is regrowing. And other areas that are going to be darker, those are different habitats. In especially in a forest, there's a, a, you know, there's um, uh, altitudinal stratification from ground from the ground to the treetops, mm-hmm. and all of these different places offer different opportunities to basically command a space you can call your own, so to speak, um, uh, to where that will, there will be there will be you know there will be resources, nesting opportunities, food, and so forth, which are specific to that sort of aspect of the environment that part of the environment and becoming adapted to that means that you're not contending not competing with species that are using other you know other parts of, of the overall forest of the overall environment okay um, now one of those one of the places is on the ground and you you know you know very well that there are some birds that forage in the treetops and others that forage for food on the ground chickens are the most obvious example mm-hmm. and you know and I've seen the answer the the ancestor of the chicken is the red jungle fowl in Southeast Asia, and it acts just like a chicken. It looks pretty much like, it's a very, very beautiful bird. It's a beautiful bird. Um, But when you see it, you say, yeah, oh yeah, that's a chicken. Okay, and and that's the case with the quail, it's the case with rails, there are pipits, there are larks, there are countless birds that are adapted for feeding on the ground. Hmm. So that, first of all, means then, that well, there's a, that's you know you, that's, maybe you don't fly very much, okay, if you're feeding on the ground, okay. There are also advantages in some cases of becoming larger, and of course this is true for mammals. It's been true for you know it's for, for, for reptiles, everything else. There are small there are small species and large species. Large species are able to take advantage of certain kinds of resources that are unavailable to the smaller ones, like in the case of birds, being able to swallow a larger seed or a larger fruit. Um, or in the case of a predator being able to tackle and you know and and overpower a larger prey item you know larger prey species of some kind so there are advantages to to ground living there are advantages to becoming bigger um, but then also there's usually some kind of a cost that's associated with with you know for every benefit there's the potential cost right Right. there are trade-offs okay and you know and one cost of course is that it takes energy just to develop different parts of the body. It takes energy to maintain muscle mass in both your wings and your legs. And if you're going to be using your legs mostly, well, it might mean and you know that it's advantageous to invest more in leg muscle than in wing muscle. Okay. Um, meaning, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is genetic mutants that develop with you know, larger leg muscles, but smaller wing muscles might have an advantage. They, and so they may proliferate and become the norm in such a species, in a ground-living species. 
And you, and you can see little by little that this could lead to, to the loss of flight. You know, if you're not using wings much, well, just, you know, the hell with it. Don't, you know, no, no, need, to, no need to keep them going. Right. Or, and of course, in some cases, it is positively disadvantageous to fly. So think about penguins. Mm-hmm. Penguins highly modified for just this amazing ability to swim underwater. And what are they using? They're using their wings to fly. Mm-hmm. They don't, you know, they don't use their feet at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I grew up in, as they say, going to the Bronx Zoo, watching. They had the they had penguins. You, you could watch swimming in a glass fronted large enclosure, and you could watch them swimming. And you know, and they're just incredible to watch underwater. Mm-hmm. And they're using wings, which are not great big feathery things that wouldn't function underwater uh, underwater as well. Um, instead, the wings are highly reduced. The long, the long feathers that's typical of a bird wing have been essentially abolished, and the wing is covered with these very small, almost scale-like feathers. So it forms a very solid, you know, solid, limited structure that is obviously, um, you know, what's hydrodynamically um, really efficient. And so there's there's all these different ways in which they will you know, birds will adapt to their environment. Uh, I'm going to bring in, you, you mentioned a little bit, I'm going to bring in genetics. You mentioned it in one of the chapters heavily in your book. Um, it, so it's interesting, right? It was interesting reading about genetics with birds because I've read about it in humans. So it's, it's, I'm trying to divorce some of the stuff I know about humans. So for how do you define uh, heritability and how does that look like in birds? And is it any different than how we see it in humans or or how does that manifest? Okay, so heritability is <laughs> you're bringing up a techni- technical term. Okay, it's a, and um, and I'm going to have to avoid getting really deep into the weeds here. Um, uh, okay, measure some characteristic on a whole bunch of individuals in a population of some species. Okay, so I mean it it could be a sample of people, it could be a sample of you know of mice, it could be a sample of house sparrows, it could be a sample of anything, and Almost inevitably, what you will see if you measure carefully is that not not all individuals are identical. Okay, when we we look at people, and that's pretty obvious, but it's equally it's equally true if you're looking at gray squirrels or red winged blackbirds or anything else. Um, if you measure the length of their legs or the length of the longest feather in the wing or whatever, you're gonna you're gonna find there's some variation. Mm. You have to ask now why do these two individuals differ from one another, even if it's only slightly. Okay, and the answer can be can be A or B or both. Okay, where A is that they have somewhat different genetic constitution. Okay, so you know we know that people with different eye colors, by and large, that's a matter of what particular what particular genetic variant they got from their parents. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to use a technical word here because I don't know how to really not not no, use it. Okay, yeah. different forms of a gene are called alleles. Mm-hmm. It comes from the Greek word from, from meaning other, mm-hmm. uh, allelos. Um, and, you know, and so you can have one form of a, of a, of a gene that affects eye pigmentation, um, and, you know, and we'll call it the blue allele, okay? And if you've got two copies of that, you've got, you know, blue eyes, blue iris. Um, and, the other, and another form of that is another another allele, a different allele, a different form of that same gene, um, let's say instead inclines you to have a brown iris. Okay. And so these so these two different alleles, you may have received both, for, you know, from, from from you know from two different from your parents, you know, one from one parent, one from the other. And maybe maybe you look in between. Maybe you have sort of hazel eyes, mm-hmm. which I think is what I have. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Where do these alleles come from in the first place? Well, what is a gene in the first place? A gene is a string of DNA nucleotide base, base pairs, okay? And, and, those, and they mutate. You get a substitution of an adenine for a thymine or whatever, that you get mutations. And some of those mutations will affect the function of the gene. Some of them don't, some, but some of them do. And those that do affect the function may result in the two alleles having slightly different effects on characteristics such as eye color. Okay. So now back up, heritability. Okay. Many characteristics are affected by more than just one gene. Okay. For example, human height. Okay. At least 200 different genes scattered among all of our chromosomes make some impact or other on how tall we are. 
Okay. And the, these are called quantity. So human height is, it's not like you're either tall or short. It's like there's every gradation in between. It's called a quantitative characteristic. And quantitative characteristics commonly are affected by several or many different genes. Okay. But in addition to that, you know that human height can be affected by nutrition. So, you know, you know that by and large, the grandchildren of immigrants who came from poor areas in, in Europe or Asia tend to be taller in the U.S. basically because they've had, had a richer diet when, when they were growing up. And so a characteristic can be affected both by environmental factors and by genetic factors. Mm -hmm. Heritability is a technical term that basically says of all the variation that we measure among individuals in a sample of individuals from a population of humans or house sparrows or whatever, of all that variation in this characteristic, what percentage of the variation is due to genetic differences among the individuals and what percentage is due to differences in the environment that they were exposed to when they were developing. Mm -hmm. okay. The heritability is the proportion, the percentage that's due to genes. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a general, that this is a general feature, and it's a general, you know, it's a general term that's used for the genetics of everything, anything. You know, you can talk about the heritability of enzyme activity in bacteria. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, uh, so it's a very general term and, and, you know, and, and the, so there's no difference between humans and birds, you know, I mean, this is why, this is why we're able to study fruit flies and mice and yeast for that matter, and draw inferences about genetic phenomena that apply to humans. You know, why else would the NIH, the National Student Institutes of Health, you know, spend big dollars on funding research on fruit flies and yeast, you know, mm -hmm. it's because what we learn from them, them carry over into humans. And of course, why does it carry into hum over into humans? It's because we're all descended from mm -hmm. ancestors that had those genes that, that, that you basically operate the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice to know, again, the kind of convergence with all of these things with different, uh, different species, you know, so, you know, humans and birds and, you know, mice. And so you talked about alleles. Uh, also, you talk in the book, it's even more technical. It's, it's so interesting because I've talked with geneticists on, on the podcast and how this works with humans. It's, it's interesting to, to see all of it kind of link up together uh, about SNPs, which is a little bit more technical as well. But I guess the question here is, is, it might be a strange question, but why would we say variation is important, right? And what does it tell us, at least in birds, right? So we have many things genetically, right? We have genetic drift, genetic gene flow, genetic variation. We have all of these different ways. And there's this, you know, explosion of sorts or this vast uh, diversification within many organisms on the planet, including birds. So I guess why is that, I guess, important? I mean, the whys are always tough, right? The hows are kind of there, but what, what can we say about all of that variation genetically and, not, and otherwise, uh, or genetics well, um, pl playment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, let's let's back up. So you're talking you 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 elided there from talking about variation among individuals within a species, and then you switched over to talking <laughs> did, yes. about the fact we have so many different species and they vary one from another, right? <laughs> you know, some of them are red and some of them are brown and some of them are black, right? Mm -hmm. And some are big and some are small. Um, so uh, you're asking now for me to give half of my course in evolutionary biology. Um, <laughs> no, but, no, no, but no, let, no, me, but let me back up. Let me let me back up. <laughs> Darwin had this, again, brilliant realization that you couldn't have any evolution unless you had variation, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you just have one type, you, you have, you know, all, you know, all birds are exactly this size and they're all, all exactly this color. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, and then that's what they're going to be, right? Unless, unless you get some kind of individuals that somehow or another are mutated or altered in some way. That they're not exactly the same, the same color, and they're not exactly the same size, but they're slightly different. Okay. And then if that variant, if that variation, if that difference in size or coloration or whatever, if it is inherited, then there's a chance that these individuals will be better off in one way or another and will have more, more offspring per individual. Their, their rate of increase, the rate at which that type increases in the population, will be greater than average, you know, greater than the, than, than the prevalent form. And that then becomes evolution by natural selection. Mm 
But you can't have any natural selection. You can't any, have any evolution until you get some until you get some differences in the first place, so that one type can end up possibly replacing the other. So this is so 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 this is the crucial thing that Darwin realized is that there is variation among individuals, and he spent a lot of words describing he had massive amounts of information on domestic uh, creatures as well as, as wild ones, documenting that there is variation among individuals and in many, many characteristics. And secondly, if it's just something that's been caused by what you ate when you were a kid and it doesn't affect your offspring, doesn't it doesn't make your offspring any more likely to be like you than to be like everyone else, well, then that you, that that particular that particular difference that you have is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't go anywhere down the down the line, and um, and so what's critical is those variations that are inherited, and that mean meaning mostly those little variations that are caused by different genes, by different alleles, okay? And of course, those alleles come into existence, we know, by a process of mutation, and we know the various kinds of mutations that can happen at the level of the DNA, uh, now that we know lots and lots about DNA. Um, and so, so the critical point of variation is that it is the raw material of evolutionary change. Without variation among individuals in the species, you don't get any evolution of that species. You know, certainly in, into a different form, much less giving rise to another species altogether. We haven't talked about the question: How do you get so many different species all from one ancestor? That's another question. Big, big question. Big chapter in the book on that. Um, uh, so um, uh, let's see. So, so that's anyway. That that's the critical point. Hmm. That um, that that uh, that that inherited variation, genetic variation, due to differences in DNA sequence of particular genes that affect particular characteristics, that is the raw material of evolutionary change. Hmm. Um, now, sometimes there are variations that you sort of you know that are really striking, and are interesting because. Um, it's not just some of these are a little bit bigger than some of that, but you can in some cases, and this is noticeable, in, especially in birds, in some cases, you'll get two quite different looking forms that are the same species, and it's just one or two genes that, you know, allelic differences that cause the difference between them. Yeah. And so, um, so one of the examples I think I cite is in the snow goose. So um, yesterday morning, I was at the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge near Kennedy Airport. It's a great place to go birding. And, and we saw about 700 snow geese there, which spend the winter there, and they'll be headed north to nest in the tundra pretty soon. Um, but the, the great majority of snow geese are white birds with black in the wing. Um, but there's a relatively uncommon form, which is the same species, but it's all kind of a slight, it's a grayish brown with a white head. It used to be called a blue goose, and it's a little bit of a bluish tinge to some of the feathers. Okay. And it turns out that this, you know, they're pretty common. You know, it depends on where you are, but they could be 5% or up to 50% of the population, depending on whether you're in the east or the west. Um, and you ask the question, you know, why are there two forms? Why hasn't one just replaced the other? You know, and 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 um, um, and so now let me let me just back up and say, well, why should one replace the other? And there are two processes that can cause one to replace the other. One is that the white form or the blue form is somehow better off at surviving or reproducing. So that would be natural selection. And if one of them really is, on average, better at, at making more of itself, at surviving and leaving offspring, then you would expect that ultimately to become more and more and more common and to take over the population and ultimately to become 100%. Mm -hmm. um, well, that hasn't happened in the case of the snow geese. Um, the other is a process that doesn't involve natural selection at all. Okay, and Darwin didn't know about this. It, it, we, we needed to know about genes in order to know about this process. And this is just the just random fluctuations in who gets to survive and reproduce this generation and who doesn't, you know, which percentages. So suppose you have 50% white geese and 50% blue, you know, blue geese. And, you know, it's unlikely that all of them are going, that you're going to have exactly the same percentage that survive to reproduce next year. Hmm. It's going to be some slight difference. Okay. 
And it's unlikely that every one of them is going to have exactly four offspring or eight offspring or whatever the average number of offspring is in the species. Some of them by chance are going to have, you know, by the luck of the, of the genetic draw or the luck of the sperm, some of them are going to have, you know, slightly more and some of them are going to have slightly fewer. And these slight inequalities mean that the next generation of snow geese isn't going to have exactly the same percentages that in, in the previous generation. It's going to be slight, very slightly different just because of these slight differences in survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. And so you may go from, let's say, 50% white to 49.93% white. Okay. And the following generation might jump up to 51%. You know? In other words, you get fluctuations. And these are random fluctuations. And mathematically, there's a whole branch of, of, you know, of probability theory that tells you that eventually, if you have these random, just total random zigzags, eventually one or the other wins out, takes over, and, and the other become, becomes lost, becomes extinct. It's a mathematical certainty that eventually that will happen, unless there's some force that tends to bring them back toward 50%, back toward the middle. So this is the process that you that you mentioned. It's called genetic drift, um, and in some cases it can be important. And that's the case when you have, when you just have a very small population of a species or a very small population of humans, for example, that are that intermarry and breed just among themselves. Then these little minor fluctuations in percentage can add up to becoming one of them becoming much more common than the other and potentially taking out you know taking over and so so in humans in some of the the um in, you know the the endogamous you know the, the religious communities that you know some, there were small religious communities that would they basically breed just among among themselves mm -hmm. instead of you know you know marrying outside the group mm -hmm. um some you know some genes for some characteristics have been known to have fluctuated this way so that they so they are you know there's a certain form of the gene would be much more common in one of these groups than it is in the population at large, just because of this random process that I've talked about. Wow. Um, so, so how important this is in natural populations of birds, for example, depends on what characteristic or what gene you're looking at. There's, there's no question. There's no, remember, I mentioned that some some mutations of the DNA affect how the gene works, mm -hmm. and some of them mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a mutation of the DNA that doesn't affect what the gene actually does, then it's not going to be any better or worse. But it might fluctuate by this random process to become a little bit more common, or a little bit more rare, and then a little bit more common again, and then more common again, and then more common again, and then rare, and zigzag its way potentially to becoming characteristic of the species, even though it has no advantage. It was just pure, purely, purely stochastic, purely random process. Could we maybe use an example here that you give in the book about, um, or, or talk about something and use it as an example here about color variation and how that's key for polymorphism. Um, maybe, maybe you could right. talk about color variation and, and how color and behavior interact. <laughs> okay, you're asking for a lot here. So, um, so I have a chapter on. I mentioned the I mentioned the geese that come in these two forms, and um, and uh, and biologists, evolutionary biologists, are really drawn to study species like that because that gives you an opportunity. When you've got two clearly different genetic forms, it provides you with an opportunity to sort of study these processes that I was just talking about. You know, we can ask, okay, is uh, are these two forms different in their ability to survive and reproduce? Is natural selection operating? Or are they totally interchangeable and it really doesn't matter what color you are at all? And in that case, maybe, the, you know, if you see a difference between a Western population and an Eastern population, and one of them has more blue in, you know, in the case of the snow geese, there were, you know, more blue, the percentage of blues was higher in the West and the percentage of the whites was higher in the East. You could ask, well, is that purely a matter of chance of this genetic drift process? Or is there something about the coloration that would make it more advantageous to be the blue type in the West? You know? mm -hmm. And um, and that's a very bad example for me to have brought up because there have been a couple of people who have studied that exact question in snow geese for like more than 30 years and they never could find an answer to the question <laughs> they really couldn't. Um, um, but in other cases what we do know is that there are 
Um, there are other cases where the color, color variations are, are important. They do play a role in the bird's life. They, do, they are subject to natural selection and they are pretty interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll just mention one. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you have a bird feeder that you keep out in your winter and you, in the winter and you live in the east, you live in, in you know, say from anywhere from North Carolina north um, up into New England, um, you may be familiar with the white-throated sparrow. Okay. Um, so it's a very common sparrow. It, um, it nests mostly in areas that have conifers like spruces, um, but it's very common. You know, I have it in my backyard right here on Long Island right now. Okay. And they come in two color forms, which are independent of, of sex. In other words, both sexes can be either one form or the other. Okay. Um, this was worked out basically by, by a naturalist. I think he was sort of a part-time birder, but you know, um, uh, about 40 years ago or so. And he realized that some of them have bright white stripes on the head and others have just tan stripes. And he, re and he discovered that both sexes can be either white striped or tan striped. And then this is the critical point. He found that almost all the mating pairs consist of one white and one tan, one tan bird. Wow. They, 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 they mate with opposite types. And so you could have a white striped female with a tan striped male or a tan striped female with a white striped male. And in the vast majority of cases, they're paired off like that. Hmm. Now, this means as long as... <clears throat> They, you know, this also means that as long as white striped females are preferring to, to mate with tan striped males, that's going to maintain the tan striped males in the population. They're going to be reproductively successful. But if tan striped females also are preferentially mating with white striped males, well, that's also going to maintain the white striped in the population. Okay, because they're so both of these are desirable to different types of females. Okay. Um, and um, and so and so so we at one level we seem to have an explanation of why we have two two types at least of males. Okay, but it's also the case with the females. And so since then it was discovered that basically white striped birds of either sex, but especially of the males, white striped birds basically have higher testosterone levels than um, than tan striped birds and they and they have receptors in the brain for testosterone that differ between the two okay so the white the white striped basically are more testosterone sensitive than the tan striped birds and the result of this is we know you know what what testosterone does to people or well, does the same thing to birds it makes them sort of nasty kind of nasty they, they, yeah, aggressive um, pugnacious and in the case of birds, very good at defending their territories. Mm. Okay, against in, you know, against in, in, in intruders who, well, for example, one of the things that a male bird has to quote unquote worry about is that another male bird may come in and mate with his with his his partner, his female partner, and he will then be and end up with a nest full, nest full of, of young birds that aren't his own kids. In which case, what would be the event? His it wouldn't be wouldn't be in you know in genetic evolutionary terms it would not be to his advantage to help rear you know chicks that aren't his own so it turns out that the the white striped birds are better at defending territories and the males are, are fundamentally more attractive to females whereas tan striped birds of both sexes are basically better at taking care of the offspring hmm. Um, they are less involved in spending their time chasing other birds around and defend, you know, and, and being aggressive to them and spend more of their time foraging and feeding the young. And so there, and so there's a countervailing advantage to both types that maintains both, both in the population. And this is the sort of thing, you know, the, the, and just a fascinating story that involves, you know, as I say, even now studies at the level of the brain, you know, mm -hmm. brain receptors for, for these proteins, for, for testosterone. Um, and this is the sort of thing that you are lured into studying once you find an example where you've got two or more genetic types in a population, mm. where there is variation in the population. Mm. Um, now, some of the studies can also be done when you have sort of what I, what I call quantitative variation. So most characteristics, you're, you know, you're a little bit bigger or smaller, you're a little bit longer winged or shorter winged. In the case of house sparrows, for example, you know, the male house sparrow has this big black uh, bib. Um, and the size of that black bib 
turns out to be, it turns out to be a signal that's used in in aggressively displaying against other males, um, and so uh, and so the size of the size of the bid turns out to make a difference to by and large how successful males are in defending their female against other male sparrows. Um, and so, you know, so studying variation, number one, the variation is in and of itself important because without it, you don't have evolution. But number two, it provides an opportunity to study natural selection or to study the, you know, the potential for genetic drift. Um, in other words, to study evolutionary processes. Yeah, that's a that's a really powerful example of of how we look at why studying variation is important. It it um, reminds me of the the part in the book where you say there are, there are three key questions to understanding evolution of a certain characteristic. You list a uh, history, uh, developmental process, and why the feature evolved. I don't. You've talked about some of that just now. I don't know if you want to expand a little bit on on why those three questions are very key to understanding that. Um, well, I, um, in in a, in, a, in a sense, you can you 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 can ask, you can ask at least two of those questions. You can ask analogous questions about almost anything. It doesn't have to be just biology. You know, you mm -hmm. can you know. I mean, if if you show someone in, in some kind of an instrument or a car, if they see a car for the first time in their life, they've grown, mm -hmm. grown up someplace with no cars, and you show them a car, and they go, "Whoa, what is that?" And their immediate answer, you first thing they would might want to know is, "What's it good for?" Uh, in other words, what's the advantage of having a thing like that? Um, and the the second might be, well, you know, where did it come from? Um, which is to some extent a question of its history. Mm -hmm. But then coming from means also it had to be made. So what was the process by which this car was actually made out of something else, whatever that something else might be? And so in the same way, you can ask those questions about about a feature of 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 of, of a human or any animal or any plant. Um, you know, one 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 in, in the almost immediate question that we tend to ask is, why does this creature have this particular characteristic, this this feature? You know, um, you you know you you know you, if you spend time looking at flowers, you might be inclined to ask, well, why are some of them yellow and why are some of them blue? You know, or why why do some of them have you know radial symmetry like a clock and others are have bilateral symmetry so they're like a human face with a left and a right side like a pea flower um and so on so you can ask you know of, of, of you know you can ask about ask about humans you know why why do men have nipples you know what are these things what are they what are they doing there are they good for anything you know and well if not why you know where do they come from and then this gets you into the into the question of um uh of you know what is what is their origin um, and uh, and that can be um, uh, in the case of of uh, you know of, of um, many characteristics you could say well it's a matter of tracing tracing back in time. Um, uh, so you know you look at the penguins' wings, and it's you know they're fascinating. But then it's really interesting to know that they evolved from from an ancestor that had a more typical bird wing with you know long flight feathers and became yeah. highly modified into the structure that I was describing earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so that so that's you know so knowing that history is just I think interesting in and of itself. And sometimes as we as we've discussed, it provides some insights into. You know where how this thing got to be the way it, the way it is, and perhaps a little bit about why. The developmental thing is, I think, is is something that tends to be neglected by a lot of biologists. But you know, but you realize, you know, here's this bird. It starts life as a single cell, just as humans do, and it ends up with all these features. You know, like and just as humans do, we end up with all these features. You know, like where did this brain come from? You know. And, and, you know, I didn't start life with a brain. You know, I started life as one invisibly small, tiny little cell, you know, this biggest little period on, in, 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 you know, in the newspaper. Um, and so clearly there's, you know, there's a whole fascinating process there by which the genes will became expressed in a process of development in which different you, 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 the cells proliferated and some cells became nerve cells and some cells became muscle cells and so forth and so on and took on different configurations so you had you know muscles and you know and 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 beaks and feathers and so forth of particular shapes 
And one of the questions you know, that I think anyone with a real sense of curiosity would ask is, well, you know, how did, what was the process by which that happened? Mm -hmm. And could it have happened differently? Mm -hmm. You know, if, you know, if genes mutate and, do they, and, does the, and the gene causes a mutation in the shape of this feather or the color of this wattle on the face or, or whatever, how does, how does the gene actually do that? You know, it's like, it's one thing to say there's a mutation. But it's another thing to ask, well, how does that actually cause a change in the characteristic, which may then have some functional consequence, some kind of, of, of survival or reproductive consequence? So these, you know, I think for a full explanation, you, you, you want to ask, you know, what was the history behind the origin of this feature? You know, in many cases, it'll be, you know, it, it evolved from some ancestral feature that was different and it took on, you know, it evolved and perhaps became functionally modified for a different kind of function. And then, um, and then that was because, in, and what was involved, it was involved in gene mutations, but the gene mutations then had to affect some actual process by which this organ comes into existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's super helpful. I remember reading the the those questions early on in the book, and it's it's nice how you say like you could really ask that really about anything. But it was really helpful to to uh, to acknowledge that. I wanna I wanna ask you about development, um, and so I guess this second towards the second half of the book. Um, I guess the first question you mentioned earlier is why are there so many birds? Like <laughs> why why is there so many? It's just again this like so like this diversification. Uh, currently, there are so many birds. Uh, obviously, there are some that have gone extinct, etc. But many, many, many. many. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> why? Well, how did this happen? Like, I mean, there's the how of it, but why do we think there's so many? I mean, not all animals, you know, have that much diversity. So with birds, what what's the oh, story I, there? I, well, if they're, you know, they're only ten or eleven thousand species of birds. You know, I mean, a, a beetle specialist would say, "Is that all? Well, that's <laughs> only one family of beetles. You know, there there are more." more than 300,000 species sure. of beetles, you know, sure, right, sure, right? Yeah. so um, <laughs> you know, there are only 10 or 11,000 species, you know, come on. Um, so um, how much time do you have for a, for a long answer? As long as you so, want. Okay, so let, 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 let me break that question down into two stages. Okay. okay. So the first stage is you have a, you know, you have, you have a, you have a species, okay. And it becomes the ancestor of, let's say, it splits into two, two let's call them daughter species. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in the course of time, each of those may split into two daughter species. So the question is, the first question is, well, how does that happen and why does that happen? And in birds, the usual answer, and now I have to back up and tell you what I mean by a species. Okay. okay. Not everyone, Rick Prom and I would not necessarily, I'm not sure we would agree on what species are, but, <laughs> um, but, um, and what I mean, and in, in, I'm a very traditional evolutionary biologist, and what I mean is that species are are biological entities. They're groups of groups of individuals that by and large will mate and reproduce amongst one another, but will not generally mate and exchange genes with the other species, okay? Um, and so um, white-throated sparrows that I just mentioned and white-crowned sparrows, I can easily tell them apart by a number of pl plumage features, but also their voice and so on, and they will not mate with one another. Whether or not you might be able to force them in a laboratory, in a lab, you know, a really desperate female might, you know, might accept the male of the other species and might and may give rise to hybrids. And the hybrids might even be able to reproduce. I don't know that anyone has tried that ex experiment in those that particular case. But the fact is, in nature, they basically don't they don't they don't mingle. You know, they don't they don't interbreed. So by and large, that's that's more or less what I mean by species. So how does that happen? It, the usual way in birds is that you have a species which becomes broken up into separate populations in, in space, different geographic populations. And this can happen a number of different ways. There may be changes in the environment so that what was a nice widespread grassland becomes interrupted by corridors of forest, you know, along rivers and, you know, and they don't easily cross from one patch of grassland to another or vice versa. You may have patches of forest um, separated by broad, you know, broad rivers or something of the kind or, you know, to, to some topography that that basically means that the birds don't cross this, this barrier uh, intervening area very often. If that's the case, 
then these processes of mutation and natural selection and genetic drift that we've talked about will transpire independently in those two segments of the original species. Those, those two, I'm going to call them populations, geographic populations. Okay. Um, and so they may, under, they may undergo different mutations that happen to be advantageous. There may be differences in the environment. One may be, you know, in one population may be living in a somewhat drier place or somewhat warmer place, or it may be living in the presence of a more abundant parasite of some kind than is present in the other place. Or there may be a different, or there may be different other species of birds that it's competing with, or there may be slightly different vegetation with different seed sources that it may feed on. So there are many ways, many reasons why there might be natural selection for some slightly different characteristics in one population than in the other population. And you will start to get some genetic divergence. And you can look at almost any bird species that is at all widespread, and you will see that there is geographic variation from one region to another. I mean, often it's pretty subtle, and this is this is why, why ornithologists have filled museums full of the skins of dead birds, you know, um, um, because you look at enough of them and you and measure enough of them, and you'll see, yeah, they, that this this species is is somewhat different in New York from the way it looks in Kansas, you know, um, and so forth. Um, and along with that, for reasons that we do not fully understand. And this is this is an area that I think is under it's under research. It, you know, there's research on it going on now, and, um, and and a lot more is needed. And along with that, can come changes in characteristics that the birds use as mating signals, mm. and in their responses to these mating signals. Mm. And so you can get divergence in song or divergence in plumage uh, features which may influence the extent to which they're likely, if they were to encounter one another, would they freely mate with one another or not? Or would they tend to mate, you know, would they tend to mate just with their own type, which is slightly different? Mm. Let me give you an example of that. Um, a very common bird in North America is the barn swallow. Um, and uh, it's Beautiful bird has really two two long tail feathers, one on each side of the tail. Um, flies about very actively, feeding on insects in midair. It likes people. It likes to nest, you know, like under bridges and and in barns and, and all sorts of human structures. And in the United States, it has a sort of orange belly. Okay. The first time I went to Asia, I was blown away because there were barn swallows, but they had white bellies. Okay. And that turns, and by and large, that's true throughout most of Eurasia. It's a very widespread species, but they're different in the two places. Okay. And, um, and Rebecca Safran at the University of Colorado has studied them and has studied the responses of females to males um, and has found that, that basically females in North America and in Eurasia prefer their own, their own type of male with their own, their own color. Wow. Okay. Um, and they also have some differences in the degree to which they prefer shorter or longer you know, these exaggerated tail feathers. Okay. And so, you know, so this is the beginning then of these things becoming different species, you know, and maybe, you know, at this point, whether or not they're so, whether or not the preferences of the females are so stereotyped, so different that they really would be, would remain different, even if you put them together, don't know yet. And that's a big problem with, 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 that's a big problem with with deciding what do we have one species of barn swallow or two species, you know, and you, you don't know unless you were to do the do the experiment, mm -hmm. which probably no one's going to do. So, um, OK, so now comes the question. Now comes the question. Why should European females prefer white bellied males and American females prefer orange bellied males? Mm -hmm. Whoa. And that really needs study. So this is where Rick Prum comes in. So you, you, you talked with Rick Prum, mm -hmm. and you know he's written a book called The Evolution of Beauty, mm -hmm. um, in, which his, in which he, it's all about this question, really, and what, most of it is about this question of why do female animals have preferences for certain characteristics in their males? Mm -hmm. okay. and, this is, and this is what Darwin, Darwin came up with this idea, he called it sexual selection, and he said this is what accounts for, you know, the peacock's exaggerated train and all of these plumes and wattles and bright color, colors 
feathers and all of these crazy features of mostly of male birds, in some cases females also, but male birds especially. And he came up with this idea that for some reason, females prefer males that have these weird, brilliant, exaggerated characteristics. Um, and um, and there are several hypotheses about why the, the then the fe- then the question becomes why what's in it for the female why should she have evolved to prefer males that have some bizarre characteristics why would a peahen prefer pe you know peacocks that have these ex- huge long ungainly Ta- beautiful tail feathers with these eye spots on them. Mm-hmm. And we know that they do, because if you cut off some of those, those eye spots, that male won't be as successful in attracting females. Mm-hmm. Um, the experiment has been done. And um, so, so this is a big question. And there are three, you know, there are three major hypotheses about this. One that Rick favors is one that is by and large not favored by too many other uh, of the experts in this particular area, and among whom I do not count myself. Um, uh, more, the most popular is the idea that the, these weird and brilliant characteristics of the male um, are a signal that the male is particularly healthy, that he may be genetically robust, able to fend off parasites or diseases, or in one way or another be successful at living, you know, <laughs> okay, and, and that it would be advantageous for a female to mate with a male like that because he's likely to have offspring that would also then tend to inherit whatever genes he has that make him particularly healthy or resistant to disease or whatever the case may be. So that's the, that's the, that's, that is the most popular hypothesis with some evidence for it, some evidence. Um, and in the case of, of Rebecca Saffron studying the barn swallows, she found some evidence, and forgive me, it's in the book, I forget exactly what characteristic goes with what, exactly what parasite, but she found some evidence that the, that the, the, um, the color or the tail length of the Eurasian barn swallow um, tends to be correlated with having uh, with having fewer nest parasites. I think there's a particular kind of it's either a louse or a or a mite of some kind that um, that can inhabit the nest and basically suck, suck the nestlings blood. Okay, um, so this is the idea that that in different places, different mutations that alter a, some male characteristic that make him particularly brilliant or vigorous. And able to produce, you know, this, these these exaggerated feathers and plumes and and, and songs and displays um, that uh, that 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 may be advantageous in terms of producing particularly healthy offspring. Mm. Yeah. This is still a big open question. Lots of research going on on it. Not enough. Not enough research that connects the this question of why do females prefer exaggerated males or brilliant males. Not you know, and not enough of that is yet asked the question: Why do different species or different geographic populations of a species, in which the males are somewhat different, why do the females? Why do do the females prefer those differences? You know? Because that's the key step now in speciation. Because if you do get to the point where those females in, in you know, those female barn swallows will, will accept only a white-bellied male, like a Eurasian, an Asian male, and the Americans will accept only an orange-bellied male, then in effect, those would be two species. Because if, if the females from one migrated into the other region, they basically would be out of luck. They wouldn't be accepting those males, you know, or vice versa. Mm. So I guess uh, one quick thing here in terms of uh, development, uh, you mentioned it in the in one of the chapters in the book about uh, why birds lay so many eggs and why females can overproduce the amount of eggs that they that they will uh, lay. I guess um, what are some of the ideas that you talk about why that's the case and why it's important? Well, I think there. I think the yeah the um um. Right. Okay. I mean, not all birds do that. You know, my my this this notion of overproduction. I mean, let's let's back up. The first principle is that um, the more offspring you you can successfully produce, successful meaning offspring that are healthy enough to have a good chance at survival. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the more you the more you can make of those, well, the more likely that the genes that enable you to do that are going to be passed on, right? They'll be passed on by more offspring, and so, and so there's automatic there's automatic selection, automatic natural selection in terms of having more offspring. Okay, all other things equal, you know, a gene, you know, any any mutation that increases the number of offspring will be a mutation that automatically multiplies itself more. Okay. I mean, the, the analog right now, by and large, and let me just step away from birds, okay? Right now, we are watching evolution by natural selection in action in the most dramatic and really terrifying way, okay? So the SARS-CoV-2, the, the COVID-19 you know, um, uh, COVID um, uh, is evolving before our eyes. Each one of these strains has replaced the other and what is that? That replacement is the process of natural selection. The you know the 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 strain which is able to proliferate more and get transmitted to more people, automatically by definition is making more of itself than the strain that transmits to fewer people. Okay, and so it's going to replace it. You know that is natural selection <laughs> between different genotypes. So by the same token, by the same token, um, you know any mutation. That increases the number of eggs or the number of offspring that in, that a female has will have an advantage. All other things being equal, but mm. not all other things are equal, <laughs> because of course, along with laying more eggs, comes having to feed more babies, right? Mm. And uh, and there you know, and there are just so many babies that uh, that a that one parent or even two parents can feed. So that, you know, so we know from experiments that if you, you know, if you add extra eggs into the nest of, of, of birds, by and large, that will tend to lower the total number of surviving offspring they have than if you hadn't done that, because basically they're trying to distribute food among too many mouths and they end up with some pretty weakling offspring that just don't have a chance of surviving in, you know, for a year. Okay. Um, and a whole bunch of experiments have, have been done. So there can't be too many. There are ways around that, though, that some birds have just you know have found. For example, a female may be able to make more eggs, and she may end up being passing on more of her genes and having more offspring if she dumps some of her eggs in someone else's nest. So, in other words, so instead of having to rear them all herself, she may be able to get um, unwitting, you know, birds, you know, and neighbors to rear extra offspring. And any gene she has that, that impels her to make more eggs and to engage in that behavior, well, that gene would be multiplying itself more generation by generation, wouldn't it? And so here you get the evolution of potential brood parasitism within species. The male equivalent to this is mating with females who are not your own, so what's called the social mate. Okay? So in the case of cardinals and birds like that, yeah, there's one male and one female that are, that are pair bonded, and they may, they may in fact both help in terms of rearing the offspring, feeding the babies or whatever. But we know now that in many, many, probably the majority of bird species, you know, males are very happy to mate with other females and have more offspring than you would see in the, in the nest that you think that male belongs to. Mm -hmm. And of course, what that means is that there may be, that there are females out there who are willing to engage in, in adultery, shall we say, okay? Um, and um, uh, and what the advantage to them might be is a great big interesting open question, in which there's been I think relatively relatively little work. In some cases, it may be that they are mating with a male who is particularly you know particularly good <laughs> at, at doing what he does at being a male, mm -hmm. and uh, and that a female may then have sons by that male who pass on her own who pass on her genes remember that son is going to have half of his genes come from her mm -hmm. and so any any genetic propensities she has to mate with a with a um, you know, a, a roving male um, may very well be inherited by roving sons. Um, so it gets a little complicated, and I'm a little worried here about getting too close to the uh, human, you know, uh, analogs. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, um, and I don't want to do that. Um, so, uh, so anyway, the, the the general message is that um, there are costs 
and benefits mm -hmm. to having more offspring to you know to in you know to and 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 the, you know and the costs basically are that you can't rear too many or else you end up not rearing not with a whole bunch of of, of offspring that have a low prospect of survival yeah what are the 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 last uh, big uh, just uh, questions I have uh, topically? I guess is on um, kind of the sociality of of uh, of birds. And birds mm -hmm. are to be social, so things such as it would common to to listeners will be reciprocity, cooperative breeding, inclusive fitness, interdependence, etc. We see these in other species. How does so we don't so I exactly the, that's exactly what I would say. Okay, you you said it. <laughs> we can move on. Is there anything <laughs> unique about them in birds or or not? I don't I don't think so. Um, hmm. uh, the um, it, it, it's just that these, you know, these things have been studied in birds probably more than in any other um, groups of organisms, um, just because birds can be easy to study. You know, you can watch them and you you can tell who's who, you know, very commonly, of course, behavioral studies are done in which you catch all the birds in, in an area of a particular species that you're studying and you fit them with colored rings on the legs so that you can tell every individual by his, his or her ring, co ring combination. Um, and so you basically then sort of see, you know, who, you know, who is, you know, who's taking care of the young, who may be, who may be helping a pair to, to you know, to take care of their young. And, um, and if you study them long enough, you trace them down through the generations and you can find out what is the actual, what is the actual genealogical Logical relationship among individuals in this population. So there have been some wonderful studies, long-term studies, obviously, in which you trace them down generation by generation and discover, you know, which of these are the offspring of which of, you know, which parents and how are they related to others and who are their cousins and so on. And, um, uh, and in these, and the, this is something you can do with birds, you know, because number one, you can watch them in the daytime, you can catch them and mark them individually. So, you know, so you can study them, you know, you can't do this with mice very well, you know, you can't do it with butterflies, you know, and so forth, um, and uh, much less other insects. So you can, a lot of this birds are just, they're just made for studying behavior. Bird, that's you know that's the that, that's why God made birds. He said we can study behavior, right? And um, uh, and um, I hope you realize that that is a tongue in cheek mm -hmm. comment. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so uh, so there have been really these wonderful studies that have shown for that have shown the relevance of the several theoretical ideas about why individuals should co cooperate with one another. Okay. Um, and, and this is a problem because, you know, there's the p potential in cooperation that you're kind of giving something. And the question is, are you, are you, are you, are you getting as much as you give, you know, is, you know, to what extent is there a benefit that makes it worthwhile to cooperate and to give, to give something, to give some help to, to someone else. Um, and birds have, have provided probably better evidence on this than almost any other, certainly more evidence than any other group of organisms because of the way we can study them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, you know, so the, you referred to, res, to, to um, uh, kin, I think you referred to kin selection, the idea that ask, ask yourself the question in the first place, What's in it for parents to take care of their offspring? Why should they care about their offspring? And the answer is because their offspring are carrying their genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you know, and if a parent has, if a you know, if, if a parent has a gene that says, "Eh, forget about your offspring," you know, that gene may not get transmitted for very many generations because mm -hmm. your offspring are not going to carry that gene on to the to the to the future. So, okay, so, um, so that's what, that's the basic idea of why parents, you know, why it benefits parents to take care of their offspring, but it can also benefit brothers or sisters to take care of their brothers and sisters, you know, or the nieces or nephews, because they, they, the nieces and nephews are also sharing some of the same genes that the, that the, the that this altruist, you know, this, this caregiver uh, has, because they're related, you know, so, um, you know, if, um, um, so, you know, I have, I have nieces and, you know, they're not my offspring, but they are related to me and they share some of my genes and, you know, in fact, they've got about one, one eighth, I believe of my genes, uh, are likely to be carried by them. I think that's the right calculation. Um, uh, and, um, it's, it's one quarter probably. Um, 
Oh, I have to do it on paper. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway um, so that's what. So that's so. In many cases, we have these beautiful studies showing that um, that individual birds often will help to raise the young of other birds, but in fact, they are helping their relatives, um, and 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 thereby the the helping gene, the gene that impels them to do any helping, is likely to be carried by those same relatives, to, you know, in large part, and so that gene will then be be propagated down through through the generations and will take over the species. And then the other is this notion of um, reciprocity, which is what humans do all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to the store and I give you, you know, and I give the clerk some money. You know, I'm not being nice. I'm just, you know, I'm getting something out of the exchange. Namely, I'm getting a cup of coffee. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's reciprocity. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be good to you if you, if you basically pay me back. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and there aren't that many examples that have been studied very well in animals. And, and, um, and one of the best is, is the, the example that I use in the book and in, in, that I won't describe in any depth, but it's, it's very cool. Um, and in, in, it involves birds um, attacking owls. Um, so uh, very often small birds, if they see a predatory bird like an owl or a hawk, very often they will go attack it, which sounds like that sounds crazy, like right? you're going to go attack your, your, your enemy, your predator. Um, and the, the reason is basically the smaller birds are more maneuverable. Usually a hawk or an owl catches its prey by surprise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but in this case, they've seen the predator first and basically they'll go and they, they engage in what's called mob, mobbing behavior. And they will, that will often recruit other birds. And so you'll have uh, very often, uh, you know, 10, 20 birds of different species all con congregating around an owl or a hawk and screaming at it and diving at it, but not too close and, um, and ultimately chasing it away. Um, and it, and uh, this beautiful experiment was, was done showing that in this one species of, of flycatcher, um, that individuals that that um, that basically uh, have been helped by other in, by other individuals in chasing away, mobbing a an owl, um, that they will then help that those individuals in return the next time there's an owl present. Um, but other individuals in another nest box that didn't come to help, then you know when they're confronted with an owl. Our, you know, our friendly, helpful bird won't go and help them because they, you know, what, you know, they didn't do anything for me last time. Why should I be nice to them? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yes. And so that's, that's just some of, some of the dimensions of social interactions among birds. Um, you know, there are, and there are others, of course. I mean, the simplest social interaction is just, you know, lots and lots of birds gather together in a flock. And, um, and in that case, they're not necessarily being nice to one another. Um, it's just that there's safety in numbers. Um, the safest place for me to be if I'm a bird and there's a falcon nearby, safest place to me to be is in the middle of a flock of a thousand other birds, right? You know? Because then the chance that I will get hit will be one in a thousand. <laughs> if I'm on my own, um, I don't, you know, the chances are a lot worse than that. I guess the the last question I have is is look there's you know birds have been on the planet for a long time they're going to be around probably for a long time and obviously you know different periods of the earth there's different changes in environments all over the globe um you know but birds have been living or cohabitating the planet with humans now and you know what what do we think about the future of birds in general and and how you know with climate change and with you know human involvement or or even or even worse um uh that that report a couple years ago that said that you know house cats are responsible for killing so many birds um what's the future of birds and and, and where do we see it going or, or how they continue well, to evolve <laughs> well yeah so i i devote the last chapter of my book to that and and um by and large, it tends to be a slightly grim chapter, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, to, well, maybe the, not slightly. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried that, that someday the world is going to be utterly bereft of birds. Uh, there, there, there will be birds, okay? Um, but there, 
at the at the present rate, there are going to be far fewer species of birds than there are. So there are ten to eleven thousand now, and I forget I I can I do not have a head for remembering numbers, but the the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has listed at least several hundred bird species that are in serious trouble, um, serious serious risk, um, uh, or serious threat. Um, and this is throughout the world. I think it's, you know, it's certainly quite a few hundred. Um, um, and that number is going to grow. The number of species that are threatened is unquestionably growing, okay? Because of human, directly or indirectly because of human activities, okay? Um, directly, the number one is the destruction of habitats, okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, we all know about deforestation of the Amazon forest, right? And, and if we were closer to Asia, we would all know about what's happening in Southeast Asia, like Thailand and Malaya and Borneo and Sumatra, in which the forest is being cleared faster than you can imagine to plant oil palm because it is, because it's, it's economically, that's the thing economically. So, um, and it's not just there, of course, you know, in the U.S., we long ago extinguished our prairies, except for little, little reserves here and there. And incidentally here, I want to give a shout out to duck hunters and goose hunters, because the National Wildlife Refuge System in the United States, in large part, is because we have duck and goose hunters, um, and, that, and that provides habitat for many other species mm. that otherwise would be even in the grasslands, in the, the northern prairies, mm -hmm. that otherwise would be even more endangered than they are. Mm. Um, uh, and so, um, so habitat loss is number one, okay? Um, number two is probably insecticides and, and, and other you know, pesticides you know, and ramifying through, through the food chain. The same problem that Rachel Carson brought to the world's attention, you know, back in the 1960s. Um, and, uh, and here it is, it's still with us, it's all over again. Um, and then as you, and then as you mentioned, climate change is, is gonna, it's gonna be the biggest and the baddest. It, it is really serious. And we don't, you know, you don't have to worry about that just because it's, it's, it's going to extinguish birds, obviously. It, it is, you know, just today's New York Times has, it's a big spread on the, the multitude of ramifications for individuals, people's lives, and it's just it's just mm -hmm. hard, too horrifying to think about. Um, and and so the question, so there's no question that many many bird species are threatened to various degrees. Um, in the book, I, I give um, I have a photo of a species of bird that I saw in Brazil in 2008, and I was shown it shown it by a very good guide who said basically you know take a look at this bird because it's probably not going to be around very much longer. Mm -hmm. And ten years later, it was officially declared extinct. Oh, wow. um, and um, uh, and so there's no question that extinct extinctions are going on, and there and they, you know for, for, for all of these these various reasons. Um, climate change is ultimately going to be the worst of it, okay? And you may say, well, the climate has changed before. Remember, there were ice ages, you know? And, and you know, 10,000 years ago, where I'm sitting right now in Long Island, was um it was you know it was, kind of, it was ice right here you know in fact there wasn't an island here the island was created by all the gravel and stuff that was pushed down by the ice sheet from from new england there didn't used to be long island sound you know um and um so so sure there have been changes before but those swings back and forth between ice you know the glacial you know ice ice episode and the interglacial warmer episodes those swings back and forth were on the order of 4,000, 5,000, or 10,000 years, okay? Here we are talking about changes of, you know, of, of, that are immensely faster than that, incredibly, right, you know, faster than that. And, you know, and you and I know, I mean, you know, like my, my young nieces, you know, who now, you know, 12 and 10 years old, you know, by the time they're my age, they're going to be in a world that I, I, I really I just shudder to think of what it's going to be like for them and for the multitudes and multitudes of other species, you know, not just birds, but other species, plants, insects, you name it, that are going to be seriously threatened. And the threat comes not just from higher temperatures, but especially in many regions from drought, 
You know, you know that there are going to be large areas that are going to become simply unsuitable for crops, for agriculture. There's going to be massive migrations of people like we've never seen before because they can't grow crops. Well, those areas can't grow insects either, and they can't grow birds that eat insects. Um, and um, and so, to, so I, you know, it it is it, it is uh, it's, it's very very sad to say that there will be some species of birds that that do adapt that are adaptable that will adapt to some of the habitat changes we have. You know, American robins and red winged blackbirds are probably more common now in the New York region and northeastern North America than they were before before you know, European colony colonization. You know, because because they they take advantage of you know of broken up habitat with you know clumps of trees and shrubs and so forth here and there interspersed with with openings. But birds that live in forest or birds that live in grassland uh, or many other you know, habitats simply don't have that flexibility. They simply, you know, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll never see a scarlet tanager, you know, nesting in the maple tree in your yard in the middle of a suburban development. You know, you're going to have to find the, the nearest, you know, fairway large woodlot near, near, near you, and you might find scarlet tanagers there. So, um, um, so there's so you know unfortunately I'm I'm very dubious about the ability of species to adapt genetically. So here now here this is where evolution comes in. The question is, could species evolve fast enough to keep pace with these changes? Well, that would mean evolving a major switch in the habitat that they use, which is by and large not something that you see happen very often. Okay. Um, it transpires what seems to be over much longer periods of time and relatively seldom. Um, and by, by relatively seldom, the reason I say that is that very commonly you'll have a large group of species of birds that are related to one another. And basically they all use, the, you know, they're all forest birds or they're all grassland birds, you know, or they're all marsh birds. You know, they don't easily adapt from one of these major types of habitats to, um, of habitat to another. Um, so, um, so I'm, I'm unfortunately just very pessimistic about, about, about the future. Um, yeah, there will be birds, but, um, but as is the case for, I think, every other major group of organisms, there's, there will be a whole lot of extinction, uh, you know, in, in the near future. Um, you know, if I were a marine biologist, I would be talking about coral reefs, you know, becoming becoming damaged bleached you know and many of them in large part to becoming becoming lost and so it's not just birds they they are the most they birds are birds are visible mm -hmm. you know birds are seen and liked and you know people pay attention to them more than they do to grasshoppers or you know or or small mammals or salamanders or whatever you know um and so you know, when you, if you become aware of birds, you become aware of the changes around you. You become aware of the fact that since I was in high school, the climate change has been enough to cause quite a few southern species of birds to expand their range northward. You know, right now where I am, mockingbirds, you know, mockingbirds and red-bellied woodpeckers are as common as can be. And when I was in high school, you had to go to Virginia to see them. You know, I remember my first mockingbird when I was in high school. It was a big deal. You know, it's a southern species that has moved north. You know, the same with turkey vultures and you know Carolina wrens and all kinds of other things. Um, in you know, there are places in mountainous areas. Many species will survive because just as these birds have have been able to move northward, colonize northward. Species that require a cooler environment, you know, will will move upward in altitude, and in fact, that is happening now. We we know in, from studies in California, especially, that species that used to nest only at lower elevations are now are now nesting at somewhat higher elevation. Of course, the species that now nest at the highest elevations won't have anywhere to go once those high elevations become warm, and, and you know they can't nest in midair. Um, uh, in tropical South America, um, there's a very there's the, the the problem of species surviving by changing their range is um, 
is a very serious one because the temperature gradient, like across Brazil, from southern to northern Brazil, the temperature gradient is so low that you have to travel hundreds of miles to get to a, to an appreciably cooler or you know, cooler area, you know, um, and uh, and this is very unlikely to be the opportunity for species to move that far or even to to have a gradient to follow. Um, uh, and uh, on top of which, of course, the whole question of the extent to which species of animals generally and plants generally, the extent to which they will be able to shift their range to, you know, to stay in their preferred climate zone uh, or the climate zone that they're adapted to, their ability to do that is going to be really seriously compromised by the fact that humans have created such barriers. Um, and so, so you have huge regions that are, you know, drive across the U.S. Drive, I, you know, I drove once from from Michigan down to South Carolina, and you go through all of Ohio and much of the rest of that trip was just through suburban development and farm fields. That's it. Period. Nothing else. No trees to speak of, except ornamental trees. You know, a forest living bird or salamander or whatever, or 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 an understory plant, you know, for that matter, is not going to be able to cross those 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 unforested areas. You know, they need corridors, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, and <clears throat> so there are all kinds of problems that that species face in the future, and um, some of them some of them will make it without question. You know, I don't worry I don't worry about about um, the the spring becoming totally silent. But um, but there's no question that humans are inevitably uh, causing what many people think is the next great mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I didn't have to end on that note. I, I was going to say I, I know it's a bleak note to end on, but um, I do think you give a really nice. Uh, detailed picture of some of the challenges that birds face, which, you know, I think can be inspiring, I think, for people to be active in various uh, aspects of conservation for, for, for birds or other animals. Um, right. Well, right. Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me back, back up because at the same time, there are things that people are doing, you know, mm -hmm. creating corridors, you know, saving habitats here and there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I contribute my few dollars to a number of, of organizations that, you know, that do this, that are ba basically dedicated to preserving as much of nature as, as we can. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course, you know, if you're a teacher, if, you know, if you, if you're at any, at any age, or if you, if you have, you know, contact with kids and, you know, and you're, whatever, a scout leader or whatever, there are all kinds of messages, ways in which you can educate people to have, make them a little bit more aware of the natural world, the rich, rich natural world around us, mm -hmm. um, and to care about it, you know, and some of, some of that will pay off. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. Well, the book is called uh, How Birds Evolve, What Science Reveals About Their Origin, Lives, and Diversity. Uh, where can people find the book and where can people find uh, you and your research and, and all that? <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the, the book is published by Princeton University Press. And so I know you can get it if you just go to print, just Google Princeton University Press and, and look up and look for how birds evolve. I believe it is available on Amazon, but um, but I honestly I'm not sure I've checked. <laughs> but um, okay. but uh, everything else seems to be. So I suppose that 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 it, that it ought to be. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly Princeton University address. Uh, uh, um, um, and. Uh, and so, yeah, and so I, I continue as a as an emeritus faculty member. Um, so I'm still I'm still on the rolls. I'm still listed as a as a member of the faculty of Stony Brook University. Um, and so that's Douglas Futuma at Stony Brook mm -hmm. um, And um, uh, yeah. And, I that's guess. great. No, that's that's that's, that's great. I, I definitely uh, hope people go out and buy the book. It's fantastic and it's, it's wonderful. And as listeners will hear, you know, uh, Douglas is wonderful at explaining many of these important concepts about birds uh, and about, I think, biology in general. Uh, Douglas, it was a great conversation. I was so happy. I, I love the book. I loved talking with you about all of these things. And um, I can't say enough thanks for for uh, 
how much fun it was and how, giving you your time and energy and your brain power for a couple hours. I, I really am well, greatly appreciative. Well, well, you know, thank you for your kind words. It's, it's uh, always nice to hear a compliment. Um, and thanks, thank you very much. And thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about, you know, things that I love to talk about. You know, that just and you know, energize me and every time. Yeah. Okay. No. Thanks so very. Thanks very very much. Bye of now. Of course. No. Thank you.